well, Emma having said she could put the lectern down, I'm a bit um, flummoxed because I would have liked it to have been wider so that I could look <laughs> commensurately narrower myself. But uh, anyway, um, I, I have the privilege of chairing the Honorary Fellows Panel for the Society. And uh, it's an interesting committee. Relatively few people are honoured by the Society and it's not a decision that is taken lightly. In fact, as uh, other members of the panel will probably um, agree, sometimes there's quite heated debate um, there are three criteria which um, are people for which people are eligible. Uh, public, a public champion of the environment uh, is the first one. Outstanding services to environmental sustainability is the second. And the third one is outstanding services to the society itself. And uh, today um, we're going to uh, award, uh, make awards to three very well-deserved people who dis join a rather distinguished cohort in government, business, media, academia, and the arts. They, all of these people have met at least one of the criteria in, in the opinion of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the panel. Now the first, uh, the first award goes to Jennifer Blumhoff, and I shall invite people to come up in a minute and collect their awards, but first of all I'll just read the, um, or summarize the citation. Um, Jennifer Blumhoff graduated in contemporary studies at the University of Hertfordshire before obtaining postgraduate qualifications in conservation policy and in education from the University of London. As a lecturer in environmental sciences, she took a leading role in the Hertfordshire Integrated Learning Project, which was concerned with the integration of skills development with academic content. And this included a strong focus on sustainability that was very far ahead of its time. She promoted an action research approach to learning and was subsequently appointed as learning and teaching development uh, lead for Hertfordshire University, driving the university to become a sector leader in sustainability education. Nationally, she was appointed as senior advisor to the Higher Education Academy's Subject Centre for Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences and uh, a member of the Quality Assurance Agency's benchmarking panel for Earth Science, Environmental Science and Environmental Studies, and an advisor to the benchmarking panel for Geography. She was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship in 2007. Always a strong proponent of the inclusion of sustainability thinking as a key component in tuition, she even tackled challenging areas such as geological exploration for fossil fuels. Jenny was a member of the Institution of Environmental Sciences Council for 15 years, Honorary Secretary of the Institution from 2003 to 2009, and a key member of the Committee of Heads of Environmental Sciences in Universities. In 2012, she was elected a Vice President of the Institution in recognition of her sustained and substantial contribution. Turning to the Society for the Environment, in 2013, she was elected as Chair of the Society's Registration Authority, uh, retiring from that in 2017. During that role, she performed outstanding service, including a major contribution to the creation of the RN Tech Register, uh, which we've just heard about a minute or two ago. Jenny has also played a significant role at the Science Council in its chartered scientist registration processes. Hence, in recognition for services to sustainability and to society for the environment, we'd like to award Jennifer Blumhoff Honorary Fellowship of the Society. Uh, and I should say it is Jennifer Blumhoff CN. In fact, I forgot that. Our second award this afternoon uh, goes to Keith Laurie. Keith Laurie was a lecturer at High Wycombe College of Technology and Art, where he started teaching business studies but specialised in law. He was appointed to head the business school at Mid Kent College of Higher and Further Education, then moved to become Secretary General of the Library Association, a role he had for six years 
where he became, uh, I think, first involved with parliamentary activity and with the Privy Council. After returning to academe as Dean of the Business and Management Faculty at Harrow College of Higher Education, he then joined the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons as Secretary and Registrar and served as a Justice of the Peace for 35 years. Uh, Keith has, is a member and supporter of various livery companies. I won't go through all of them here because we'd be here for a very considerable time, I think, but it, it includes the Worshipful Company of Chartered Secretaries, the Guild of Educators, and the Guild of Nurses, both of which I think subsequently became um, uh, livery companies. In academic retirement, supposedly, Keith was appointed Learned Society's Liaison Officer for the Foundation for Science and Technology, where he served for over 20 years. He advises on the administration of learned and professional societies. It's in, in that context, I think, that he has advised the society during its 12, 2017 to 19 governance review, without which the society would not have been as effective in its engagement with its constituent bodies, with the Engineering Council and other related parties, and indeed with the Privy Council. Keith has been a major influence on the Privy Council, uh, on relationships with the Privy Council in 20, February 2019, this year in particular. We are indebted to Keith for his sterling service and his contribution to the society, which has since extended to also assisting a number of our constituent bodies with their own governance challenges. So Keith, can I invite you up? Our final award this afternoon um, goes to uh, Graham Wynne. Uh, Graham Wynne's early career was in urban planning and inner city regeneration in London. Today, Sir Graham Wynne is a distinguished fellow with the World Resources Institute, an advisor to the Global Commission on Adaptation, focusing on nature-based solutions for adaptation. Between 2010 and 2018, he was special advisor to the Prince of Wales International Sustainability Unit, working on forests, land use, climate change, and commodity supply chains. Simultaneously, he was also a member of the UK Climate Change Adaptation Subcommittee. Prior to that, from 1998 to 2010, he was chief executive of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Graham has also served on innumerable other panels, including the Lawton Wildlife Review Panel, the Policy Commission on the Future of Farming and Food, the Sustainable Development Commission, and others, and he's currently on the board of Green Alliance. Graham um, is, uh, is no doubt going to give us a, a reveal a little more of his own uh, activity in the lecture which is going to follow uh, this, uh, this talk. And uh, it, the lecture is entitled, going to be entitled Integrated Approaches to Environmental Protection and Restoration, Benefits and Pitfalls. So, uh, Sir Graham Wynne, we're honoured <coughs> to award you uh, Honorary Fellowship of Society for the Environment in recognition of your services to the environment. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much indeed. I am honoured. Um, I've been elusive, so I'm particularly grateful to the Society for tracking me down. So it's, thank you very much indeed to several people. Um, and I've, all, I've even been elusive in terms of telling them what I was going to talk about tonight. I have been up to my neck in this, I was about to say, wretched Global Commission on Adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating exercise, but not tonight. I'd also love to respond to a dozen of the things that have come up during the course of the afternoon. I think some fantastic talks, by the way, some extremely interesting and perceptive talks, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I enjoyed the minister. 
But again, I'm keeping you from your wine, so I decided to be unusually disciplined, and I will stick largely to the thoughts I had. And that is to, you heard very, a resume of my career. Um, it was slightly odd in 1986 to leave from the urban planning environment to go to nature conservation and the rural world. It was considered a very strange thing to do. I don't think it would be seen to be so strange now. I think most people would understand that if you're actually involved in, in environmental planning, many of the issues cut across. But it was an odd thing to do then. But I want to return to my planning roots, and I could have called this talk, I think, the Confessions of an Unreconstructed Planner. Uh, it's also the case that I probably did less planning in my 15 years working in inner city London with various boroughs and the GLC than I did either at the RSPB in terms of planning internally, advocating planning to government and to others, and certainly in terms of what I've done in the last 10 years where quite a lot of it has been about advocating integrated approaches and planning. Planning became unfashionable pretty much the time I qualified, I guess, um, and has been largely out of fashion ever since. And I was fascinated by the talks, which is what I quite like to be able to respond to, but I, I'm, I'm going to be disciplined, in that how many different ways we're creeping up on spatial planning, integration and spatial planning, rather than actually saying this is what we need to do, because it is politically extremely challenging. So my thesis is fantastically simple. It's, make the obvious point, strategy and planning without in action or knowing how you're going to get the action is an utter waste of time. So no question there. I salute everybody on, who's on the front line delivering the real goods, and I don't care whether it's at village green level, individual water body level, um, through to much larger scale issues. I think everybody who's working on the front is fantastic. But perhaps challengingly, I'm going to say that disparate ad hoc actions, no matter how well designed and no matter how well intentioned, will not add up to the scale of solution we need in the face of the challenges in front of us at the moment. And that we need integrated approaches to the environment and that as far as possible, those integrated or where relevant, those integrated approaches need to be spatially expressed and through plans. That's the simple idea that we need at this juncture, big, bold land use planning ambition nationally and even more so globally. As a collection of what I would call, I'm increasingly calling environmental tribes, I don't think we've done that well so far in sorting out an integrated agenda. Um, and I was heartened by, I, I wasn't knowing I was going to be heartened, I was slightly concerned about where the net gain discussion had got. But both of the key talks on that, on the net gain, biodiversity gain, and particularly on the net environmental gain, actually made me feel very positive indeed that we are again creeping up on this integrated agenda. But by goodness, it's a slow journey. It really is. And I come, you know, I spent a long time in the nature conservation world. Even bringing together the biodiversity tribes is an astonishingly difficult feat. And those of you who've had to deal with them professionally will know that. They, they're really, they're, they're, there's brand jealousy, there is intellectual jealousy, there is advocacy jealousy, there is blah, 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 blah. So then trying to bring those biodiversity tribes together with the whole environmental community, which is what we have to do, I think is a very big challenge. But I think it's absolutely essential. And I think, as I said, increasingly that needs to be expressed spatially. So let's just illustrate very briefly a few of the areas where I think we're not getting it. The biodiversity community, the best brains in the world now, have identified something like 4% of the terrestrial surface of the Earth as key biodiversity areas, 4%. Half of them aren't yet protected or recognized. We've done a much better job in protected areas in general. You'll know the HE target, some of you. We've got to about 15%. Half of them are in the wrong place. Most of them are poorly managed. You've heard from uh, the director of Q first off, We've heard the one in five species facing extinction globally. And in fact, we are, as you know, um, I think on the verge of the sixth 
mass extinction event since complex life forms appeared on Earth. It's a pretty astonishing thing to be saying if you think where we came from. And that's not hype. Again, that's UN speak. That's quite conservative speak. Nobody knows what the real answer to this is. And anybody who tells you they do, I think, is bullshitting, if I can put it bluntly and plainly. But there are some incredibly clever modeling going on at the moment in various quarters uh, on, on, on all continents. And it's interesting that some of this modeling is seeming to come around to not dissimilar conclusions, that whether it's the land or the sea, something of the order of 30% of it, and it's not randomly selected, it has to be in particular places, but something like 30% of it would need to be, uh, how do I, protected, let's say protected, more importantly, where human tread is incredibly light. I'm not saying no human interaction, but where the human footprint is fantastically light. You can argue about the percentages, 25, 30, 35%, some people are going higher. And of course, that isn't in isolation. We also need at least that much again, which is very, very carefully, sustainably managed. Harvey Locke, someone whom some of you may know of, has got a nice image of, of looking at the world in thirds. So a third as cities and intensive farmland, a third as shared space, and a third as effectively set aside for nature. I don't care what the percentages are, they're massively way over what we're achieving at the moment. And we know, and all of you know as professionals, it's not going to happen if we simply ask businesses, governments, farmers, landowners, anybody else, simply because nature is nice to have. And we want to keep nature. It's not going to work. The opportunity costs are just too high. Now, I do think the natural capital agenda is helping. I think the economic valuation of the functions provided by nature, the services provided by nature, is getting somewhere. And again, I salute all of those, the hard slog that's been put in over the last 20 years to take us to where we've got to. But this is comparatively rarely, I think I'd stick my neck out and say it isn't yet normally spatially um, designated. It isn't leading through to land use planning. And until we actually change the way or manage the way land is managed for the environment and the seas, we don't get there. And therefore, I think there needs to be a spatial um, expression of policy wherever possible. I won't go through the entire environmental agenda, but I am going to touch on two more. Carbon and climate mitigation, 30% now, broadly accepted figure uh, of, of carbon that we could, um, we, we, we could take out of the atmosphere through nature-based solutions. Um, I put together, I didn't do the work, but I, put, I edited one of the reports that, that put that figure out there early on, um, five, six years ago, and it's been corroborated by much cleverer and better people than the people who put that report together. Somewhere between 25 and 30, 35%. But the climate mitigation community, the professional community, to be honest, is still fixated on the energy sector, the transport sector, which are obviously critically important. I'm not challenging that at all. But the truth is we cannot meet our climate targets without tackling the land use issue. And without that 30% of the solution coming from nature-based solutions, we don't get there. Is that reflected in land use policy anywhere? No. Despite, again, fantastic efforts by the REDD community, um, and Norway and others who've tried to stimulate this globally, progress and carbon markets for, for forests, progress is phenomenally slow, and it's not there. Third, the climate adaptation agenda, which is the one I'm working on at the moment, nature-based solutions. Um, I'm allowed to write wonderful sentences like, uh, nature, natural assets are humanity's first line of defense against climate risks. And there it is in the report. You'll see it when it comes out. Uh, it'll be launched at the Climate Summit in the uh, UN in September. I think that line is likely to survive because everybody loves it. But there's nothing underneath it. No one is assessing. So tell me if I'm wrong. If anybody knows anywhere in the world that is, global, is assessing their natural assets in terms of their climate risk reduction potential, even identifying them, let alone mapping them. 
So we've got bits and bobs of nature-based solutions going on all over the world. We've got brilliant schemes. I've, I've produced a chapter which has got 20 fantastic examples. You know, mangrove swamp restoration on the northern shore of Java. Uh, wetland coastal restoration on the eastern coast of America. It's all great, but it isn't adding up. It's not being looked at at a strategic scale. So part of my thesis is that to do this asset by asset, function by function, we don't have the firepower and we barely have the time. The proposition is simply, why don't we identify, map our natural assets against the various environmental values and functions we need, assess the priorities for protection and restoration, look for the overlaps and synergies so that we can make common cause wherever possible, but be very clear about the outliers and the trade-offs and the contradictions so we can address them in a grown-up way as well, and offer as clear a picture as we possibly can to policymakers who, to be honest, are befuddled when they are confronted with 17 different environmental agendas. They're confronted with 10 different biodiversity agendas before you get to the rest. It's not going to work. So there's lots of reasons why we're not making faster progress. Um, some of them have to do with tribalism which I started with, and I think we've got to, to break down those tribal barriers. And I think this society and you as a collection of individuals are probably at the foremost in being able to help that happen, certainly nationally. There are other substantive reasons. Um, I, as, you, as you will have gathered, as well as an integrated agenda, I want, want this to be spatially mapped because I think it helps policymakers. Of course, when you do that, the congruence of various different environmental values isn't necessarily that high. So it works incredibly well, for example, between tropical forest and biodiversity. It doesn't work very well, for example, between biodiversity and soil carbon outside the tropics, and so on. Nonetheless, um, there are a number of us who are promoting uh, sophisticated overlay maps at the moment. And this, it does seem to me that the starting point has to be where are the synergies? Where are the overlays? Where can we get multiple benefits from doing the same thing? And as I said, then where are the outliers? Where are the trade-offs? And then we are both in an informed position, and I think we're in a much stronger advocacy position, and I think policymakers have got a chance of taking this forward. There are um, pitfalls. I'm only going to mention one given time, and I'm keeping you from your wine. But one example of the obvious pitfalls is that multifunctional planning can lead to lowest common denominator or averages. Neither work. Um, we don't need lowest common denominators, and averages, as you know, can be incredibly misleading. Very brief illustration. I hope it doesn't give offense to anybody in the room who's involved with forestry, but the bond challenge on forest restoration, fabulous. A re real huge supporter of it. 300 million hectares now have been uh, identified globally for forest restoration. But I did make the mistake four years ago of starting to look under the bonnet of what's there. Two thirds of the commitments are for monoculture plantation, palm oil, etc., or agroforestry. Okay, these are necessary things, not arguing. If you look alongside, if you then model what the carbon sequestration and storage capacity of that form of those forms of restoration are, alongside the claims that are coming out of the bond challenge, they, they, they just don't marry at all. And I would refer you to, this was finally brought together by Simon Lewis in a piece in Nature, an excellent piece in Nature in April, short comment piece, I really would read it. It's a great illustration of just how, uh, dare I say, lack of policy integrity can lead us a long way astray. We need absolute policy integrity. I'm not saying anyone was deliberately deceiving. It's just wishful thinking. And the biodiversity benefits out of that two thirds were negligible. So this isn't about lowest common or not denominators. It isn't about averages. It is about, as I said, just being transparent about what we've got, where, and what we need to do with it. So I'm getting the signal. I will wind up. Reasons to be cheerful, three. It's good. It's fine. I mean, it, we're in a much better place than we were. The, the, um, the, the congruence of various international conventions coming up in 2020, not least the Convention on Biodiversity in Beijing, 
has stimulating some fantastic work. And one I'm proud to be on the very edge of is called the Nature Map, which is being pulled together by UNEP, WCMC in Cambridge, EASA, fabulous modeling organization in Austria, and Q, amongst others. And we're producing a more sophisticated version at 10 kilometer uh, resolution of a global map overlaying five different values for biodiversity, three different values for carbon, and we're still trying to work out how to get the water layers on there, but we will. It's not the answer to the world, but it is a complete step forward from where we were even a year ago. And the restoration potential will come there forward as well. This isn't prescribing what nations should do. It's giving them an in interactive tool eventually to enable them to see if they want to do this, this is where they would best do it, and this would get them to this measure. Great, really exciting. Two, perhaps an unlikely candidate, China itself, not just holding the CBD. Some of you may have come across China's redlining policy. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's, we started writing this stuff and we suddenly discovered China was starting to do it and had been doing it slowly since 2016. And it is most advanced in Shanghai, but it is mapping against, for ecosystems against disaster risk reduction potential against biodiversity hotspots, against habitat fragility, and oddly, the one that isn't in there is carbon storage. Um, and we're now talking to them about how they could build that in. And their redlining policy, it can't be exported from China because of the, the nature of Chinese politics in the exact autocratic way. The red line will go around this and it will be restored or protected. But I think the notion is absolute, of, of integrated planning is incredibly encouraging. And last, I think assuming the government accepts the Climate Committee's report on net zero, and once it looks at the land use components which are going to have to be tackled, I think how it won't be called land use planning, it won't be called spatial planning, but I think the appetite for taking a completely different look at the UK countryside is not that far off. You cannot countenance the scale of woodland and forest expansion, wetland restoration um, that is needed to give us a dog's chance in hell, excuse me, of getting to net zero in land use, let alone in the economy as a whole, without someone actually saying, well, actually, here's the best place to do it. That doesn't mean to say it does has to be a, um, a dictatorial, you are gonna change your field from pasture to woodland. It means let's have the opportunity maps out there. What's good for carbon? What's good for water? What's good for biodiversity? What needs obviously to be protected at core? Where is the restoration potential? And then let's come to the thorny, but not impossible policy debate about if we know where we want to go to, what's the best way of getting there? How do we bring the majority of people with us without actually upsetting everybody? And oddly, at this stage of my career, that seems like a second order issue, although it's what I spent nearly all my life working on, how to do it, rather than where do we do it? What's the ambition? Where have we got to go to? So my message or request to all of you for World Environment Day tomorrow is please go forth and integrate. And where possible, do it on a map. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, um, Graham, thank you so much. Um, thought provoking, challenging. I'm glad you're out there doing and fighting for all of that. And I think you've inspired um, many people.